Okay, thank you all for coming to this uh, panel discussion about animal welfare uh, in libertarianism and the liberty movement. Um, I'm happy to be able to introduce to you three wonderful speakers on this topic. Um, first off, we have Mr. Tom Palmer. Um, he is the Executive Vice President for International Programs at the Atlas Network and also a Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and the Director of Cato University. Uh, you might know him from uh, one of his books, one of the many books that he has. Yeah, like this? More like this? Okay. One of the many books that he has uh, written or edited, such as Realizing Freedom, uh, The Morality of Capitalism, and Why Liberty. Um, then here in the middle, we have Daniel Issing. He is um, currently the Charter Teams Program Manager for Students for Liberty. And um, he has studied theoretical mathematics at the University of Munich. Oh, I'm saying it wrong. Theoretical and mathematical physics in Munich. That's actually something quite different. <laughs> um, and he is also a member of European Students for Liberty Animal Welfare Commission, uh, of which he will surely tell you more later. Um, and then right here next to me, we have Alfredo Pasqua. Um, I would describe him as a Students for Liberty's own drug policy researcher. Um, he wrote his thesis uh, in public policy on the legalization of marijuana in Uruguay. He's lectured a lot about that topic recently, and he currently works as a business developer for um, the International Cannabis Corporation, which is the world's first industrial, medicinal, and recreational cannabis corporation. Um, so I will tell you what we're going to do now. We will first um, discuss the topic of animal welfare in the liberty movement for about half an hour. Um, and then there will be a Q&A uh, in which the audience can ask questions to all of our speakers. So I would like to start by asking um, all of our three speakers to give us their thoughts about one question, namely, um, how did you get interested in the topic of animal welfare? And um, I've also understood that all of you are vegetarians, am I correct? Okay, so maybe you can also tell us a little bit about how you decided to become a vegetarian. Yes. So, is it fine like this? Yeah. So I guess two random things happened in my life. The first one was that when I was a child, I grew up spending a lot of time in the countryside, surrounded by all sorts of animals, not only cats and dogs. And I could never see this distinction most people made between animals that you have for company that you don't eat and animals that deserve death and be being eaten. Uh, for me, that was never so clear. Um, but it wasn't still enough to me, for me to become vegetarian. The reason why I ended up becoming vegetarian was that many years ago, uh, I had a girlfriend who was vegetarian, and of course I could eat meat, but uh, we wouldn't cook twice which meant that I was eating less and less meat until I realized that for me it wasn't a big effort to quit eating meat. It was actually a very simple thing to do. And since that moment I could feel much better that I am not eating the animals I like. I just want to ask you a quick follow-up question. And the story you tell about growing up surrounded by the animals. Uh, if the animals that you were cooking, imagine that they were treated nicely, right? So the baby cow was like in the field with his mom all of his life and then only in the end he got killed. Would you eat it then or is it like more of a principal stance not to eat animals at all? Um, so I would say it's a principal stance that I do not eat them at all. Uh, but again, first of all, I don't think there's a nice death. You are still killing them even if you are treating them nicely. Uh, and the second thing is that for me it's not an effort anymore not to eat meat. It's not that I see a piece of steak there and I think, oh god, I want to eat that and I can't. It's a natural thing for me. I don't need to eat meat and I don't feel bad when I see meat in front of me and I cannot eat it. So the answer would be no, I will, I will still not eat animals anymore. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, so for me, uh, the story began, I think, some seven years ago, roughly, um, in the most geeky way that you could probably come up with, namely by reading a philosophical treatise on the topic. 
Um, so it was just one um, coincidence, a book that hit me at the right time. Um, maybe some of you have heard of the philosopher Peter Singer. He's not really a favorite of libertarians that I know. Um, but he's written one of the first books on animal rights back in the 70s. Um, and after having read that, I started questioning my own attitude to eating meat and whether this is really something I would want to continue or um, if it's uh, maybe not easier to abandon eating meat um, and try to uh, prevent the animals that I would eat from being harmed in that way. Um, it was not a process that was done in a day or so. I read the book and the next day I became a vegetarian, but rather a very gradual one. Um, still, I would say that uh, reflecting about it more and more, I just couldn't justify, I guess, uh, for myself anymore that I continued to eat that. And so eventually um, I finished or stopped eating meat altogether. And nowadays it's, it's very similar to what Alfredo just described. So I don't really have a desire anymore to eat meat. Um, it's almost a habit not to do it and to some extent I would say that I even develop a kind of disgust uh, when I see meat, um, which is strange for me because it was very hard in the beginning to change my diet to a vegetarian one, um, but it's not impossible. It's a pleasure to be in a room full of animals. Uh, we are all animals. Uh, and we're capable of experiencing pain, anxiety, emotions, uh, fear, love. Uh, and that is one of the things that launched me on the path that I took personally. Uh, for me, libertarianism is about my rights, but much more importantly, it's about respecting the rights of other people. Most people try to defend their own rights. This is actually not that hard to get people to do. It's respecting the rights of other people. That's what libertarianism is about. It's the key element. It's not me, 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 screw everyone else, I don't care. It's not using force on other people when it might be convenient to do that, to get their stuff or to make them change their behavior. One of my personal heroes, Joaquim Nabucco, who is a Brazilian abolitionist and classical liberal thinker and writer, uh, in his book on abolitionism, after he had succeeded in abolishing slavery in his native Brazil, he has a very powerful statement. And the first time I saw it, I was struck. I said, this is what I believe. He said, we should educate ourselves and educate our children and the love of the freedom of other people. For only when you love the freedom of others will you appreciate your own and have the courage to defend it. And that to me is what it means to be a libertarian or a classical liberal, not just me, 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 although me is important, I don't diminish that, but respecting the importance of others and being alert to their rights and even their interests. That's what Adam Smith teaches us. We are alert to the interests of other people in a free society as well. Uh, given that and that sort of Adam Smithian orientation, I began to think about the suffering of other creatures. And when I learned about, when I was fairly young, about the uh, uh, foie gras, I said, I cannot eat that. The, what is done to geese is so cruel and monstrous. I can't eat that anymore. When I learned about factory farming of pigs, although pork was a very important part of my diet, growing up with a German uh, cooking mother, uh, a lot of pork, but I cut that out of my diet. And then I asked myself a question. I was uncomfortable about the suffering of animals that I contributed to because animals don't grow in little plastic packages, uh, contrary to what we might think. They're, they're out there on farms, and some of them have good lives and some not, especially the ones that are factory farmed. <clears throat> I um, asked two questions. Number one, the purpose of ethics is not to go around feeling uncomfortable. It's to try to lead the correct life. And if I'm uncomfortable about something, I should stop doing it, not just continue being uncomfortable. And then, second, I had a health crisis. I was very severely injured a number of years ago and lost the use of much of the left side of my body. And you do not want to hear how painful that is. It's unbearably painful and awful. And, uh, and to be partly paralyzed also. And the person who helped me more than anything else was my cat. 
She loved me and she would come galloping into the room when I would shout in pain or, or when I was trying to walk and fall down. She'd come right to me, are you okay? Is everything all right? She would spend hours sitting next to me with just her little paw on my side when I was shaking in pain because I didn't want all the opiates which they offered me because they make you really stupid. And I said, I'd rather be smart and in horrific pain than feel good and be stupid. As she sat with me, and I asked myself a question after that. I said, could I kill her and eat her? It sounds so crude, of course not. But I said, you know, I do that to other animals that are just as smart, that could have a similar relationship with me, that can feel fear as I know she fears it, and anxiety and love and affection. So why would I kill those animals and not her? And I thought, well, I don't have to go through life eating animals or buying animal products like that. Uh, I don't live in a society in the edge of existence where it would make a difference to life and death. I think it would be different then. I don't live in that society. I live in a fabulously rich time in human history. And I can live very well without doing that. So I stopped. And I had meat cravings for a long time. And now I don't. Now I feel a bit similar. I, I find the idea a bit unattractive and unappealing, I, I have no desire for it. And on those occasions when I do get a meat craving and I reject it, I feel a moral victory. Just a little small one, but I get a personal reward that, okay, I could have cheated, and, but I didn't. And I think I did the right thing. The last point we will talk about further. My view is not, I'm gonna crusade the world and every time I see someone eating a hamburger, I'm gonna hit him on the head with a baseball bat. Uh, that's not how the behavior should change. I believe there's a continuum, and if we can encourage people to engage in less cruel practices, it's better. And I think that we could improve the welfare of animals incrementally and on the margin, and I'll be happy if my behavior contributes to that. So um, thank you for uh, clarifying the relation between uh libertarianism and, and animal welfare, as we're sitting here um, in, a, in a libertarian student conference. I heard you say that um, as a couple of quotes about liberty being also about respecting the rights of others. Um, do I take from your story that you are, would be in favor of animal rights as well, or how should I interpret that? Yeah, you. I think this is a bit unsettled. Uh, I don't think animals would have the same kind of rights that, let's say, Bulgarians have. Uh, the right to be respected, I'm looking at Stefan Kolov here. Uh, that, uh, so I don't take that perspective. They don't have the right to freedom of speech and things like that. It doesn't make any sense. But I do think we have obligations. The question is, does that involve the state enforcing them in the form of rights or restrictions on our behavior. I do think that uh, certain kinds of behavior like battery hens where the chickens in this little tiny thing and they cut their beaks off and those poor little creatures do suffer terribly. Chickens are not the most morally sophisticated animals but there's no, no reason to want them to suffer in this monstrous little tiny box for their whole lives and then they're they're destroyed in a very cruel and, and heartless, terrible way at the end. Uh, so I do think that cage-free and what is called pastured eggs with the chickens outside doing chicken things and has a reasonably good chicken life uh, is a big improvement. Should those be legislatively mandated? I have to say, I wouldn't promote it, but I'm not upset when it does happen. This is a kind of awkward position. Uh, for me, but there's another angle, which is the good news is that in much of the world, the wealthier parts of the world, animal welfare is entering into the consumer functions. People look out for that and firms find it's better to advertise cruelty-free and better treatment and so on. This is not true in very poor parts of the world with rising incomes. They, most people couldn't care less about animals. But as incomes rise, people become more sensitive 
There's a reason why the English were the first people to go mad for animal rights. They're the first really capitalistic mercantile nation. And to this day, English people pour out in their thousands to carry buckets of toads across the road so they don't get hit by cars. Uh, it, they got that humanitarian element from their embrace of, of markets and trading and concern for others. So I think the, the trajectory is a good one, but I don't think I would march down to the legislature and say you should put fines on people whose behavior is not appropriate. The last thing though, and this is a bit awkward for me, if I did see my neighbor torturing his dog or cat, I would go and break his nose because I, I would find it very difficult to restrain myself on some kind of uh, facile argument that the dog is a piece of property the same as a desk or a pencil. And if you break your pencil, no one would stop you. If you broke your dog in half, I'm pretty sure I'd come over and stop you uh, from doing it. And maybe I should suffer a penalty in the process, but I think it would be very difficult to tolerate that if you could do something to stop it. Well, if I may add to that, um, I think that the question after oh, oh, about animal rights is maybe also distracting us a little bit because then at some point the question comes up if, say, a worm should have the same rights as a human being. And I don't think there's really a lot of people in the animal welfare movement who advocate such a position. Um, what we should really focus on is the mass amount of suffering that is inflicted upon animals. Um, and that's not about whether you kill a worm that you accidentally step on, but it's, for example, about factory farming. Um, maybe just to give you some numbers, there's an estimate of around 40 to 60 billion creatures that are slaughtered every year for human consumption, excluding fish and seafood. Um, if you look, for example, at uh, chicken, there's around 99.9% .9 that are raised uh, using methods of factory farming. Um, so um, I believe that discussing whether it's okay in the end, for example, to go hunting, kill animals and eat them is not really the important one because it makes up a, a fairly small percentage of the, the animals that are actually consumed for food. The, the real big question and the real big suffering happens when we look at factory farming. Um, and I think animal rights might be distracting us a little bit from focusing on that. Um, so to answer about animal rights, I also tend to avoid that term. I think it's quite complicated to talk about rights, but I do think there's something I would call animal worth. I think, I think they have some, some moral worth for being animals. Um, and for me, uh, that means that I would also go help that dog that is being mistreated, not because the dog have, has a right, like a legal one, but because it's worth it's worth it, like his life or its life, it's worth. So that's why we would do it. Now, the, the counter argument to animal rights or what I would say animal worth, it's usually that um, um, all humans, for instance, have self-awareness and animals don't. So that's why we can consider humans as one category with rights and all non-humans as a category without rights. Well, that's not so simple because, first of all, not all human beings have self-awareness and we, we don't want to eat those who have no self-awareness. And self-awareness is also a complex concept because like, the question of who am I is not so simple. We've been trying to answer that for a very long time. Um, while I do think that most animals or all of the anim animals that are not humans do not have the same type of self-awareness that we do have, they still have some sort of self-awareness. And there are some experiments that have been done with especially primates where they draw a mark in their forehead and they, they can find it and see that something's wrong with that, how did it end up there. So they do have a se some self sense of self-awareness. Um, and they do, as Tom said, share basically the same feelings we share, like fear, pain, and, and love. So they are capable of feeling as well. So for all of these reasons, they have worth. I don't know if they have rights, but they do have worth. OK, so even though Mr. Palmer was a little bit in doubt about this, I would say that in this panel, there is a sort of consensus against government intervention to secure animal rights. But correct me if I'm wrong. 
A consensus in favor? No, no, against. Like uh, that, nobody. You are not in favor of government intervention uh, to secure like animal welfare. As I said, it's a topic I'm a bit. I'm not. My thoughts are not very clear on the issue. It's very difficult. But I do think that, for instance, uh, making bear baiting illegal is okay. Uh, bear baiting is an exceptionally cruel sport people used to enjoy. And we try to remember how much kinder have been people have become. It's hard to remember when you think of all the horrors, the terrible things that people do to each other. The general standard of human behavior virtually everywhere is much kinder than it was not very long ago. People used to consider it immensely amusing in France to nail cats to trees. And of course the poor animals screaming and shrieking and this was considered tremendous sport. Lots of blood sports with animals that today we would just find repugnant and horrifying. We wouldn't want to do that. Well, in many communities they made it illegal to have dog fights and so on. Uh, and people in some occasional cases still bet on these animals tearing each other to pieces. Should that be made illegal? Uh, I'm not convinced it ought to be. At the very least, I'm not upset when it, is, when it is. And it seems to be compatible with respect for human rights that we put limitations on the brutality and cruelty that we can impose and inflict on animals. And I think that is consistent with a broadly free society even though it's difficult to find an axiomatic derivation of that policy. But maybe that's not the right standard for thinking about law and justice, that it should just be a derivation from axioms. Human sentiment may also play an important role. Um, well, there's maybe one reason, uh, one way in which I would be skeptical of having governments trying to regulate too much in there and maybe even going so far as to outrightly uh, ban slaughtering of animals. And that is, um, if you look, for example, at the evidence from the war on drugs. So imagine what would happen if we'd outlawed slaughtering animals by tomorrow. Would people all of a sudden stop eating meat? Or would we rather see something like a black market in meat production rising up? Um, that's actually way worse because there's no way that you can control the conditions under which the animals are raised. So um, I, would, I would probably agree to most of what Tom said, but I guess if you go too far, if you try to regulate it too much, um, much as I'm, as I'm uncomfortable with it, um, you might just unleash a reaction that comes closer to the war on drugs than a reasonable way of dealing with animals. And I'm a bit sorry that I'm taking this point away from Alfredo, who's way more knowledgeable about drugs than I am. Um, so, <laughs> so maybe he wants to add to that. Um, so yeah, I basically agree with Daniel here. Uh, I think that right, just banning the production of meat won't help at all. Um, I'm also quite skeptical about uh, government intervention in this area. Um, I, what, what I do would like to see more is this discussion going on, especially among libertarians. Um, I think it's a good thing that we're doing this for the first time here. Um, I've never spoken about this issue before in my life publicly. Uh, so I joined this conversation here because I think it's important that we start talking about this, especially because of other trends I've been seeing within libertarianism and it is what I call contrarian libertarians. And these are libertarians that think that because we want to defend free speech and we are against, for instance, government intervention to regulate speech and political correctness, that doesn't mean that we should be mean to other people or we should not be respectful. You can still be politically correct and respectful to other people and oppose uh, laws that would ban free speech or think about tobacco, it's the same thing. I oppose government regulations when it comes to tobacco, but I still think tobacco is a bad habit. I, don't, I wouldn't encourage you to smoke or I wouldn't work with the tobacco industry. Uh, and when it comes to animals, for me it's basically the same in, uh, in the sense that I, while I do not support government intervention there, I don't think as many libertarians 
think that because it's a leftist issue, then we should eat animals as much as we can and, and, and I don't know, kill them for fun or whatever. Um, so that, that's not the case uh, for me as well. So as you just said, um, animal welfare is quite a left-wing issue currently. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands and we actually have an animal party in the parliament got five seats in our recent election, but it's a pretty left-wing party on, in every respect. Um, how do you guys are going to uh, convince your fellow libertarians to put the issue of animal welfare on the libertarian agenda? And what do you think they can do to, you know, participate in the promotion of this issue? So first of all, I think vegetarians, libertarians need to come out of the closet. It's like, we don't talk about this, but how many vegetarians do we have here? Like, okay. <laughs> so you see, it's probably more than what you expected. I thought I was the only one, then I met Daniel and, and Tom, and we all think that it's only like two or three of us. Well, there's more, so come out of the closet and start talking about it. Um, the second is what I, where we are doing here, start doing, including this topic in the discussion and, and well, see the reaction and how it keeps moving forward. Um, I think one thing that's important, and sometimes our fellow libertarians fall into this trap of being contrarian just to be a jerk. Uh, it's not politically correct to do this, so I'll do it, just to be a jerk. As a simple example, people want to smoke, that's their business. But I have met young libertarians who say, I'm starting smoking because it's politically incorrect. I said, that's just a great life plan. That's brilliant. You're going to increase your risk of dying young to piss off your professor. Excellent, way to go. This is really stupid. And if it were politically incorrect to jump off of cliffs into giant pits of broken glass, would you do that uh, and harm yourself? This is dumb. But related to that, people say, yeah, bacon. We like it because other people are critical of us. Well, okay, fine. It just seems very adolescent and childish and something that serious people should avoid. We should have our own moral core of what we believe in in living our own lives, try to live a good ethical life with all the elements that come with being happy, being responsible for yourself, and so on, and not doing these things just to annoy our leftist uh, friends. It's silly. Finally, here's a good news from a libertarian perspective. Uh, our leftist friends, who might be interested in animal welfare, if many of their policies were implemented, it would plunge us into the dark ages. And the dark ages were really terrible for animals, the cruelty and so on. The good news is advancing wealth and advancing markets makes other non-cruel options more possible. Look at the increasing vegetarian options in restaurants and uh, stores. Used to be you had a vegetarian meal, said, so I'd like the vegetarian plate and they brought you a pathetic broiled tomato with breadcrumbs on it. It's like outrageous. This is food. Everyone else is having some amazing thing and I get a tomato. But that's not true anymore. Now they, they put effort into making things that are tasty and interesting and so on. Uh, and if you want meat substitutes, there are a lot of things that they really taste like meat. And it's getting better almost every month and this is free market capitalism driving this procedure. So if you want to embrace that, embrace more options, and you can have meat substitutes. Trust me, under socialism, there was no meat substitute. There was animal flesh and a potato. And that's what you got. Um, but now we have all these things, and it's because of free market capitalism. We should embrace it. The last thing, one thing that's coming is lab-grown meat. I think this is going to be great because you get to have a ribeye steak, but Bessie did not suffer. You can have a pork chop that was grown in a lab, and the prices of these are coming down. They're still expensive, but it's not $204,000 a kilo. The prices are dropping rapidly. People will be able to have a pork chop 
without the suffering associated with factory farming of pigs today. And I think this is going to be a great triumph. It'll be a triumph of entrepreneurship and free market capitalism. And so people interested in animal welfare should celebrate that. Um, I think one additional thing I could add here is um, a more, you know, ivory tower kind of perspective. Um, I actually think talking or, or thinking about animal welfare probably also helps us to become clearer about the kind of political philosophy that we advocate. So I see that we spend a lot of time talking about um, the sphere of actions that would be allowed for an individual to undertake, so what is permissible to do and where is the freedom of others infringed. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about who should comprise that category of individuals that have um, individual liberties. And I think the answer that humans should have it is a bit unsatisfactory because it's, it's actually not an argument at all. It's just saying that somebody who has a certain DNA should be part of a group, others not. Um, and so thinking a bit more about this on the implication that it would have for, say, elderly people, severely mentally disabled people, children, um, born and unborn, um, would also help us to become a little bit clearer about what libertarian philosophy is actually about. Okay, um, we have like 20 minutes left. Um, I wanted to end with one final question to Daniel from myself, and then we can go um, to the audience for questions. So, um, Daniel, as I said in the beginning, you are a member of ESFL's Animal Welfare Committee. Could you maybe tell a little bit about that? Um, sure, I can. So, um, well, honor to whom honor is due, maybe Carlos wouldn't mind standing up because he is actually the person behind this entire committee. You see him right in there. Um, uh, so the Animal Welfare Commission was a thing that we came up with uh, during a, an executive board retreat when we noticed that, as Alfredo uh, mentioned before, there's actually more uh, vegetarians and vegans among us than we thought. Um, so what we did so far is um, we formed a committee and tried to bring these kinds of events to our conferences. So we had three of them in Spain where bullfighting, for example, is still a big issue. Uh, had one panel at the International Students for Liberty conference just a month ago. Um, a big event in Belgium and now here. So uh, I think in a way we're really trying to raise awareness of the topic and maybe also convince the outside world, so people who are not already part of the libertarian movement, that we're more than just selfish and very money-interested people, that, that we're actually pretty diverse. Some of us care about things that are traditionally considered leftist, like animal welfare. Hello, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask as a consumer, or what you think about, if, that, uh, if I want to improve the life of the cows, I could uh, boycott buying milk and not drink it, but this would make for the farmer only option to increase it, lower the cost. But if, on the other hand, if I buy cow from happy, for milk from happy cows, this would give the incentive to, for, to farmers to improve the life of the cows. So uh, I'm not sure if it's the right choice to adjust not eat meat, but, but it should be like eat meat from happy animals. <laughs> I just, I'm sure my colleagues have uh, thoughts on this. You can do that now. You can go to uh, stores in most European countries, oh, actually I'm sure all European countries, and there will be ratings on how happy the cows are. Are they confined all the time? Uh, same thing with chickens and so on. So when I buy eggs, I buy pastured eggs. I learned that's the one that's not in a barn. Those are still cage-free, but in a barn. Pastured are doing, having a kind of chickenish life outside eating bugs and grass. And they're more expensive. They also taste a lot better. Uh, and I do eat eggs. I don't have a big problem with eggs if I think that it's been treated in a, in a better way. So if you're willing to spend a little bit more money, you can do that. And one of the things is to ask, uh, what's the rating on this? And now in wealthy countries, this is becoming much, much more common. And so you can exercise your preference in this way. And I, th I think, I don't know, I'm sure, but 
my colleagues certainly agree, there's a kind of continuum. If people will move from less cruel, or from more cruel to less, it's an improvement. And this is certainly the case with dairy cows who don't have a great life, by the way. Your typical big dairy farms, not, not happy for the cows. They only last a few years, and then they do kill them. Uh, so don't think they go to some cow retirement house uh, afterwards. They, they, they slaughter them when they're not in their peak time. Uh, but you can spend a little bit more money and feel better about yourself in the process. I mean, one response I have to that is I do not actually believe that the, the sheer number of animals that we're consuming at the moment, that this could be produced in an animal-friendly way, um, that there, is, there are just not enough resources, not enough land to actually provide that um, in a way that would make life for the animals nice. So there would be a need to reduce meat in order to have it all raised in a well, animal-friendly way, I don't think the amount that we consume at the moment could be produced um, like this. Mm, what I do prefer, uh, these happy cow kind of things, um, we need to be careful if it's not just a marketing strategy, just for you to feel good about yourself. We like to feel good about ourselves, so we like to buy from the package with a happy cow. Um, but how happy is a cow, it's a question. And even if it's a happy cow, would you kill it yourself to eat it if you, I mean, think about it. You have a happy cow, you go and kill it, and then you feel good about yourself. It's like contradictory. So just, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't like to judge other people for what they eat. Uh, so it's up to you what you want to eat, of course. Uh, I think I'd rather someone eating, uh, someone being conscious about what they eat, and I think this trying to look for products that are as free as possible from animal cruelty is the first step. So that's a good thing. Uh, it seems the panel is a bit uh, unbalanced on this topic. Um, obviously, you're not uh, arguing uh, regarding um, consciousness of, of the animals and. Um, regarding humans um, and out of consistency uh, and your, your, more base, your argumentation is more based on something like natural rights, etc., I think. Um, out of curiosity and regarding consistency, and I don't want to start a, a second debate, but uh, are you all also against abortion? If you're against killing, uh, killing and hurting animals? It's a little difficult to hear, so I'll restate and correct me if I'm wrong, that you are suggesting that all the discussion was based on rights. Okay, I don't, I don't agree with that, and I think the other two didn't agree with that. It's based on concern for welfare. Not all of moral interaction is characterized by rights. Right? And this is something that's very important for people who believe in liberty to, to, to embrace. When someone acts in a very bad way, and you come say, that was a bad thing to do, to treat that person like that, say, yeah, it's my right. This is not a good answer, right? That there's more to moral behavior than your rights. This is a, a caricature that libertarians suffer from, uh, that all we care about is rights and not being good people. Being just is not enough. We want to be good people and live in communities with our neighbors and family members and friends. Uh, so it isn't just about rights, it's about concern for welfare of others. And there are many occasions when no one has a rights claim on me, but to be a decent person, I should respect their interest uh, and acknowledge it and possibly help them. That's part of being a decent person. So I have a more Smithian perspective on this and less let's just be frank, Rothbardian, in the following sense, I have great respect for Murray, I knew him very well, but I found his perspective crazy, uh, which is, you're in the right to cause another person to die trying to get into your lifeboat because, damn it, it's your lifeboat, and if you want him to die, that's your business. I said, this is crazy, this is not possible. Uh, there are other standards of human behavior. We do not celebrate people doing such wicked things, even if on someone's theory it's a right, which, by the way, I disagree it's a right in those cases that he raised. 
So it's not about rights. Now let's come back though and dial it back and ta talk about uh, unborn humans. Let's use that term. Uh, I have, my view is I'm sympathetic to the pro-life case. I'm not convinced. And I think that the American standard of the three trimesters is a reasonable attempt to grasp this. Uh, a blastocyst of eight cells, it's hard to argue that this is a, an entity we should be greatly concerned about. Uh, but in the uh, third trimester, we have something that does seem to respond to pain and stimulus and so on. And that seems to be a great concern. And what is called partial birth abortion by the critics or late-term abortion by people who support it, it seems to me that's very hard to defend. Aborting a fetus hours before the mother would go into labor and killing it by putting scissors into its head and vacuuming the body out is a very hard thing to defend. Saying that, I still think it's consistent with being broadly pro-choice. Very few women in that situation decide in the last week to have an abortion, having carried a, a fetus so long. If they do it in the first trimester, at least under American law, there's no question. Second trimester, there's a higher standard. Third trimester, there's a presumption it not be done. It has to be shown to be to preserve the life uh, of the mother. Uh, I don't think that's an unreasonable standard. Uh, for abortion, and I do have concern also for the fetus. What's the difference between being inside a woman's body and being outside in terms of the moral status and the ability to empathize and be concerned? But I do think there's a difference between eight cells and billions of cells. In an eight cell blastocyst, this doesn't concern me particularly. Uh, if, if someone has an, a morning after pill or an abortion in that first trimester. So broadly, I'd be pro-choice. In the American context, I think the courts tried to get it right, and they came fairly close. Hi. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start by making myself unpopular by saying that I work in politics, and inadvertently, animal welfare has actually become um, one of the, the policy issues that I deal with on a daily basis. Um, first of all, wonderful that, you know, um, capitalism has made us wealthy enough to have this discussion. Brilliant thing. We should never forget it. Um, and I think actually this discussion also kind of goes to a lot of basics, because we're arguing about, you know, what are rights, what kind of ethics should we pursue, and I've, I've sort of got three questions, two very small, one more broadly, um, in terms of defining animals as one could as well with toddlers, for example, or, or small children or fetuses, um, where you might say these are not human beings that have human rights per se, they are still an ethical category and therefore ethically we ought to act towards them in a certain way. Do you all kind of follow broadly a deontological ethics in the sense that ethical um, acting, moral acting is about duties towards other people or other beings that form some kind of ethical category? Um, These are hard questions. Maybe we can do one at a time. Yeah. Okay. You guys um, want some thoughts? I guess I can. <laughs> I mean, I would need a few minutes to think about your question, but to try to answer right now, um, most people here are familiar with the non-aggression pr principle. Of course, libertarians tend to apply that only to human humans. Uh, for those of you who do not know what it is, it's basically what Matt Kibbe was talking about yesterday and the title of his book, Don't Hurt Other People and Don't Take Their Stuff. Um, um, and of course, I agree with all of that. Uh, the thing is, it seems natural for us now that human beings is a separate category above everything else, and that's why only humans have these rights. Um, but a few hundred years ago, it was natural, or it was mainstream, that only white males would have these rights. And if you were black or woman, then you were another category, category not worth of these rights. Um, so I think, thankfully, this has evolved in the past hundreds of years, and we now think that 
women and other races also have the same rights as white men. So while I don't put animals in the same category as humans, I welcome um, people trying to live their lives uh, causing as less harm as possible, not only to humans, but also to uh, other animals. Very briefly, uh, deontological is not right, the right language, in my opinion, in this regard, but we can talk about having duties or obligations of care or concern or non-harm to other creatures. We certainly have them with regard to children, I do think children have rights. They have very robust rights. They do not have all the rights of adults to make choices about themselves. That's why they have guardians and parents, because they do not have the capacity to envision their future life uh, as an adult does. But they also have some rights that adults don't have, like the right to be cared for by their guardians. They do have claims uh, for food and shelter and love and affection from their guardians, and those guardians can lose the guardianship powers that they have if they fail to provide what is due to the children. The courts will take their children away, so you're unfit uh, parents. Uh, so I think that that's a good model for thinking about children. Should we apply that to uh, animals? Maybe in a, in a much more limited way. Animals don't grow up to be adult humans. But again, if I did see someone torturing a dog for sport and just, you know, I could hear this, the peals of, of uh, suffering uh, from a dog, um, I have no doubt that I would break down the door, go in, and rescue the dog with, with minimal force exerted, despite how wonderful the force would feel when I would treat someone who did that. I would want to do it with a minimal amount of force and just rescue the dog. And maybe at the end, the legal system should say I have to give him $40. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, then sort of the, I think this is very interesting in the sense that, you know, maybe the non-aggression principle doesn't capture all of ethics, all of morality, all of thinking about law. The second question then is, if we're trying to define this in terms of, of, of you know, creatures that we have some ethical obligation to, where do we draw the line? If I'm, if I'm freaked out by Belgians. a spider... Belgians. Belgians, I know. <laughs> terrible, terrible people. Um, but, you know, if I'm scared by a spider that pops up in my bathtub and I squash him with my foot, am I doing something terribly unethical? Or is this a different category? You said, for example, chickens aren't morally complicated beings, dogs and cats perhaps or more so, do we draw a line somewhere and does that have implications about what ethical behavior toward, towards certain types of animals are or are not? Um, I don't think you would ever be satisfied with just about any animal that I named you and saying everything that's below it in terms of consciousness or so shouldn't count as something worth taking care of and everything above should. Um, Let's look at an analogy. Um, those of you who are not anarchists um, and favor some kind of minimal government would probably agree that this government needs to tax people. Will they ever come up with like the right amount of taxes, uh, the right percentage uh, at which it should be? Or is it not a gray zone where we're going to be arguing should it be a little higher, a little lower? Um, it's a very difficult question, obviously. Um, so. Uh, I see a lot of good arguments for giving or endowing, uh, say, apes, pigs, um, cows, and so on, with uh, more protection or kind of rights, if you wish, uh, than we currently do. But um, as, I, as I said before, I don't see us um, doing it all the way down to something like a spider, for example. Um, also because at some point it becomes unavoidable. Um, just uh, probably by, by walking along the hallway, you'll be killing uh, quite a bunch of bugs and other animals, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so it, I, I can't give you that line because there's a gray zone, and we will have to figure out what the best approach to that is without having an axiomatic approach to it. Um, but I, I do say that where we currently draw it, which is very often just um, based on the fact that humans constitute their own species and non-human animals don't, uh, is insufficient. 
Um, just very short. Um, for me, it's also difficult to draw this line, like above this line, animals have consciousness before they don't. I would say that try to live your life causing as less harm as possible. You will cause harm eventually. You cannot avoid it. Just try to minimize it. And I think that's compatible with liberalism. Behind the question, where do you draw the line, is the sense that all slopes are slippery. If you don't draw it here, my God, we're going to be worried about microbes. But really, slopes are not that slippery. Uh, we shouldn't be terrified of slippery slope cases. There is a distinction between a cockroach and an eagle, or a cockroach and a dog. And so I, I don't worry that if we can't draw a line, that somehow we throw the whole thing out. But we have all kinds of cases where there's some difficult cases, even in dealing with human rights, uh, and so on, or rights of the mentally retarded, and so on. So this, I think, is just a non-issue. We shouldn't really worry about it. And last point, I do think insectivore is much better than carnivore in the sense of eating cows. And in the village my family lives in, uh, they actually eat a lot of bugs. I'm so grossed out by that. And I have no more, very little moral objection, maybe none, to eating creepy crawly things from the trees. But I had to say, I can't see that. It just, the cultural disgust is so high. I just said, I, I do not do that near me. I have to leave now. It's so gross. But intellectually, I understand. I'd much rather have more of that than eating pigs and cows who do suffer. Whereas I don't think the beetle has, has a great awareness of what's going on when it's uh, consumed. So. Insectivore diets would be a big improvement if you get, get over the intense disgust factor, the icky factor that our culture has, has filled us with. Um, maybe you can answer with a very short yes and no. Um, from the suffering argument, right? Uh, would, you, uh, would you say that um, killing very large animals, big animals like, for example, whales, um, could be justified on the wealth, animal welfare basis because the suffering um, induced, well, the suffering caused by the death of such a big animal is outweighed by the benefit which is brought to a large amount of people who enjoy the meat of such big animals. Yes or no? If you had a strictly utilitarian approach and you're measuring all well the utilities, you could say, okay, kill the whale. The problem with that approach is it would also justify cannibalism if you had really gourmet cannibals. And you don't want to go down that road. I think this is not the right uh, kind of moral reasoning for thinking about these things. There are agent relative restrictions on us that even if Gilles here, for example, he might be very tasty when crisped up. Uh, but, but it would still be, I think we could all agree, it would probably wrong, be wrong to do that. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the amount of utility people might get uh, from doing that terrible thing. It's just a bad thing to do. We should restrict our own behavior uh, in doing that. But I will add one quick point about hunting. There are times when it would be more cruel not to hunt. We've eliminated wolf populations, which is very sad. There are very few wolves left in Hamburg, for example. And the consequence of that is that other animals breed much more rapidly. Well, deer are not big on birth control. They will breed so much, there will be so many deer, they will then starve out and there will be thousands of dead deer. And if you do not hunt them to cull the population, you will lead to a really terrible starvation in the deer population. So I think you could make an argument there that hunting would actually be the more ethical response as opposed to non-hunting given that those bad, very bad, wicked Germans got rid of all the wolves that used to eat Germans on a regular basis. Uh, so given that, you could make an argument for hunting. I don't think it works very well with whales, but it certainly does with deer.
not the vegetarian whales. Um, a tough question, to be honest. Um, I think I have my problems, but that might not be very well founded with the fact of trying to kill somebody for the benefit of others. Um, because, um, yeah, I mean, in, in some way, of course, these whales do not really have a choice. It's not the same as a human committing a crime and then we put him behind bars because we wanted to punish him for that action. But there, there is no process of conscious reflection of uh, what they do. But it's, it's a feeling of being uncomfortable with that, maybe a concern about something like biodiversity, um, much rather than a stringent philosophical argument, I think. I would just shortly add that I'm not especially appalled about whale hunting, for instance, or whale eating. Um, I think all cultures try to think that the animals that they eat are good to eat and other animals aren't. So we think, okay, it's horrible to eat dogs or to eat whales, but it's good to eat cows. And maybe in Iceland, they think it's, or it's called Faroe Islands. They think it's good to eat whales, but it's not so good to eat other animals. And it comes to the beginning when I was saying that for me, it was always hard to make the distinction of which animals are good to eat and which animals are good company. Okay, guys, I think we are through all of our time. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. There will be dinner downstairs now, so I hope that we can continue the discussion there. Um, please give a warm applause for all of our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>